Hey, everybody, this is Jason Creel, and I appreciate you guys being on. We've got some questions lined up already. So i um, got my friend and special guest, James Barley, on here. So, James, as always, this is second time being on here, but you may have seen him on the channel before, and he comes to my uh, conference and has spoken in all three of the Lawn Care Life Conference. And what we're calling this is Lawn Care Live, okay? That's what the Monday night uh, episode is being, but – James, appreciate you uh, being on here again and looking forward to letting you hear your answers to all these hard questions that, that I don't know the answers to. We'll give it a try. All right. James is, uh, so, you know, we, he and I have known each other for a long time and uh, he's the one that helped me get started in the weed control and fertilization business. He's got over, uh, was over 30 years experience in the business and then what was why you, how long you been with Harold's? Maybe seven years or so, James? Or in my tenth year. Tenth yeah. year. Okay, so um, James works with Harold. So if you hear me talk about buying Harold's fertilizer and that sort of thing, um, I, James is my sales rep. He covers Alabama. Uh, let's see, parts of Tennessee. Covers Mississippi, Panhandle, Florida. So you know he's got a fairly large territory in the southeast. And for those that not in territory sometimes people contact me and, and james helps me connect them with a, a rep in the other area so you can uh, get in touch with us if that's something you won't help with but we're gonna let you guys direct the conversation again we uh i got james on here i said hey it's about time for at least for us warm season guys to uh fertilize lawns i thought we could talk about fertilizer but as always you guys ask whatever you want and uh We'll, we'll uh, address just about every question we can get to. So, all right, let's get started. <clears throat> hey, Jason, I would like to know your opinion on adding biochar to the lawn to enrich the soil. This is from Eric. Thanks, Eric. James, what do you think about biochar for enriching the soil? Well, carbon is in there. Carbon is food for microbes, beneficial microbes. And if it's, if, if, the population of beneficial microbes um, beneficial to the grass plant are not where they need to be. You can get a response from a product like that. And there's so many of them out there. Uh, but biochar, you, we're really just talking about carbon and carbon is food for those um, beneficial microbes. Generally what happens, it, it makes an incredibly good environment for root growth and root hairs and that are actually taking up the nutrients. So you can get an increase in, in root growth and root uh, uptake of nutrients that may already be there. Uh, my hesitation if on anything like this would be, uh, is that already occurring in your soil without adding it? Do you already have healthy soil? And I've told, I told a guy one time, I said, take the product, and I, I won't mention the name of the product, but it, it had carbon in it and um, it was probably something very, you know, similar to what he's talking about here. And I said, spread that in a stripe right down the middle of the lawn. Don't do the whole lawn, just spread it in one stripe and watch it for a few weeks. And I never heard from him again until he called about something else. And I said, Hey, by the way, how did you, how did that look on your Bermuda? He said, I never, I never saw a difference. Yeah. So there, there could be a situation where in warm season grasses, you already have pretty healthy soil life and you might not see a visual difference and you may be spending some money you don't have to. However, I've seen situations where you did not have uh, healthy soil or uh, the, the soil life in there was needy. And these type products made a huge difference in rooting, survival, I think it's a, probably a bigger deal in the cool season market where uh, fescue and maybe Kentucky bluegrass, and I'm not a cool season expert, but I think you need all the help you can get to get through the summers with those cool season grasses. Yeah. And so those kind of things, or a golf green that is growing on mostly sand and is being mowed at a tenth of an inch. <laughs> I don't know what the exact height is. They have a, a height system. They talk about what number they cut the greens at, but um, I think when you have a, a stressful situation, it's even more critical to have a good soil health for that turf type. Hope that helps. 
Craig says, good evening. North Texas clay soil with new Bermuda sod placed in December. Plug aerate now or wait? It's greened up well for what it's worth. What do you think, James? He put his sod out in December. What, do you, what advice would you have for Craig? I'm not perfectly sure on North Texas clay soil, but I'm going to assume it is a one of those shrink swell type. You remember in South Montgomery when you and I were both there, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, they called it the Black Belt or Prairie soil. Yeah. And it's it's a very clayey uh, type soil. It will actually expand and contract with rain and dry drying out, and it kind of aerates itself in a sense. Um I'm going to throw this at you again. Aerate part of the lawn. See what it does. I did an aeration in my lawn in Montgomery. It was not a uh, North Texas clay, obviously, or even a the prairie clay that I'm thinking he's probably talking about. Um, and I couldn't see a difference. I think my rooting was deep enough. Also, if you get really compacted, sometimes the aerator won't even create the hole you wish it would because it's so compacted, the aerator won't go down in there adequately. So I never saw a significant difference. I know it's used a lot in reseeding or overseeding or interseeding on uh, cool season grasses and probably just stirring up the soil a little bit and aerating. Uh, University of Georgia did some work years ago, uh, Dr. Caro, and he was showing in some ways that the aerator was creating compaction. So the the soil between the tines where the tines were hitting into the soil were creating compaction between the, the tine holes. And so, I, you know, I, I would do a visual. I would, I would do part of the lawn and look at it. If you're not getting a visual and turf improvement on there, I would have to ask, is it worth the investment? It may be. Now he you know, may or may not, he may not he may be paying somebody to air I don't know or he may be doing it himself but is, is there anything about James as far as the timing him putting it down yeah. in December is it is it too early to should he wait well, a little bit let it get rooted or what Yeah I'm glad he said uh, it's greened up cuz um, I I would feel like you probably could go in there and do it without hurting Bermuda's tough and if it's already greened up and he can't pull it up, pull the side up. And I, yeah. I have a feeling mid-May, uh, even in North Texas, it's probably rooted where he can't pull it up. And so I would probably not be afraid to treat it, fertilize it, or aerate it. Gotcha. All right. Joseph says, hey, Jason, how do I get the tall peace sign bahia grass out of my centipede lawn? There you go. It shouldn't be making the peace sign yet unless you're uh, – Maybe my, anyway, my behalf that I've seen around here is not quite uh, putting out the seed heads yet. But um, you let's know. do this, Jason. Let's do this. Let's ask everybody that's asking a question to say where you are and what grass type that you All got. Right. Man, this, right. in this in this it. case, in this case, he said centipede, but but he could, and, and it's probably not in Kentucky, you know, or somewhere because centipede yeah. is not that cold tolerant. So let's go with. That he's somewhere in that I-10, I-20 right. corridor. And, uh, I would say a not higher than a half an ounce of MSM or Manor, which is metsulfuron methyl, uh, is will take bahia grass out, at least reduce it. And centipede is it's labeled for centipede, but no more than a half an ounce per acre. And so some of the other grasses you can go at a higher rate, but centipede is a little sensitive to it but uh that would be the go-to product just be yeah. sure you don't over overdose the centipede yeah i usually go a quarter of an ounce and and uh and don't do it while it's you know you you should be fine now but don't do it in march or something when it's half grain you you it'll sure enough to turn your centipede yeah. yellow so yeah. uh anyway all right how's Jose says, how do you get more customers? He's got two questions here. And how much do you charge for mulch? I think we addressed some of these questions last week. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about customers, Jose. But you, uh, you know, I, I, this is my standard answer here. But you, you, you got a, you got short term and, and long term. You know, to me, the long term, you get a website that in today's uh, marketing world, you have a, a website that ranks well in, in Google. And you may say, well, I don't want to do that. I'll just tell you, that's how 
a lot of companies get lots of customers. For me, that's the best way I get customers is through having a website that ranks well on Google. Um, the other thing you do that's kind of both short and long term is you, you get to know people in town who can send you referrals. So like I said, if you're the weed control guy, you get to know the mowing guys. If you're the mowing guy, you get to know the weed control guys and let them send you customers. And then if you begin building your customer base, you got all these customers who can send you uh, you know, send you referrals. Now, again, that, that might not fix your problem next week, but you, you that's going to be your long-term approach, in my opinion. Next, as far as short-term, I mean, just being active in, on social media, like in these local Facebook groups, and, I mean, knocking on doors and being out there on Saturdays when people are working in the yard is also effective because a lot of times people are making spur-of-the-moment decisions on who to hire. As far as charging for mulch, you know, usually we we're talking about last week, like if you get a, a yard of mulch, I, I don't remember if it comes in a yard, half a yard, what it, but, you know, for $35, you, you basically quadruple that. And, you know, so people are saying they charge anywhere from $120 to $150 uh, with it installed that, that might have cost them $35 to buy. James, you got any more thoughts on getting customers? You know, maybe, uh, and, and I've been out of it for 10, almost 10 years. Uh, yeah, I've, I've known some guys that got real involved with like civic clubs. You know, you got a banker, you know, you go to the bank, wear your shirt, wear your hat, have your cards. And you may meet one person that likes you and wants to give you their business. And they know six more people. And so I would take every opportunity to, to meet people in whatever circles you run around in and, uh, let them, you know, wear your shirt says the name of your company, tell them what you do and ask, just say, if you ever need any help, let me know. I'm, I'd love to help you. And you'd be surprised people. You can ask for the business, not necessarily ask for an estimate on the spot, but just let them know what you do. Robert says, uh, Hey, and I was noticing his shirt. I, I have it. You know, people talk, I don't know if this is what that shirt means. If people talk about who's the goat, you know, the greatest of all time. So it's, is uh, Michael Jordan, the goat of basketball and all that. Is Nick Saban, the goat and all this. His shirt has a greater than sign. He's greater than the goat. So I'm assuming that's what that means. But anyway, uh, Andrew says, hey, Jason, what do you do on rainy days or in the winter time? Any tips would be appreciated. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons I started spraying yards is uh, in, at least in Alabama where I live, you know, we, we it's year round. I don't. I could probably work 365 days a year if I wanted to. I had to do my commercial properties on Christmas Day so I wouldn't interrupt anybody. But anyway, I, I don't want to work that many days. But I'm just saying the business is there year round. Um, so that's a a huge plus. It, you know, people that live up north, they get into the snow plow and all that. If you're kind of um, maybe you're mowing grass further south, then a lot of those guys, they, they kind of – structure their business in a way where they get year round contracts that can kind of get them through the winter or they, they pick up an additional service they can offer, whether that be, uh, well, you know, the weed control stuff, they start doing landscaping and things like that. So, um, you know, I, and there's people that just mow grass in the summer, mow grass eight, nine months out of the year and, and take three months off in the winter. And that, if that's what they can do with their income, then that's fine too. Uh, I, I, that's not a good formula for me. I don't, but some people can make that work. All right. How soon should I buy a bag of seed in order to do a renovation in late August, early September? Does sell by the date matter? I'm assuming James are talking about a, a cool season lawn. Is that do they do they oversee them things that early? Like August, I guess if you yeah, live in Maine, Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say Canada. Uh, let's let's assume he's got the right uh, calendar window there. And uh, I, I I've heard that last year's seed even can still work if it's stored properly. And yeah. a lot of times they will do soil so uh, excuse me seed viability tests to to make sure the seed are still good, but. Uh, I've even heard somebody say last year's seed worked better than this year's seed. Now, I'm just the messenger there. I, again, I don't do the cool season thing much at all. But uh, I am hearing rumors that a large seed uh, producer 
has is might be moving all their seed to the box store market, you know, like the Home Depot type stuff and pulling it away from the professional line. And so there, there may be a, it may be like toilet paper. It may be hard to find seed. So if I had some seed now or last year's seed, I might have it regardless of, of per, how perfectly well it works. Cause that may be better than none. All right. Kevin says, is it beneficial to continue with 2,4-D in a prodiamine mix or separate and just use 2,4-D this time of year, central Mississippi, Bermuda? Is there a reason for them to continue using prodiamine right now, James? Yeah. I, you know, uh, if you want to extend the crab pre-emergent barrier a little deeper into the calendar, uh, first your first application needs to be obviously before crabgrass germinates and to add a little more is, is commonly practiced, but usually everybody's through with even the additional uh, application. So if you had somebody that signed up late or, um, and, and this may be an individual, I don't, I don't know, as opposed to a company, uh, but I like to pull away from 2,4-D when it gets hot on Bermuda in central Mississippi. I think you get, you get more, uh, discoloration on the turf when you got 2,4-D in there. That's been my experience. Uh, so there's some products out there that you can use that have less discoloration. Also, the type of weeds you're likely to have in May and June when all the cool season weeds die, 2,4-D may not be as effective as some other products. So there's two reasons why I'm moving away from it. Uh, maybe some turf discoloration and maybe just not as effective as some things like fluoroxapyr, um, fluoroxapyr, a change-up, uh, manner combination type thing where there's no 2,4-D in there. I've seen those not have any uh, side effects or discoloration, but really hammer the difficult weeds that 2,4-D alone could not do. All right. Charles says, hey, Jason, I'm in Mississippi and I have warm season grass. My soil is very clay. I believe it's hard for many plants to live in clay soil. What's the best amendments to enrich the clay soil Air, aerator <laughs> kind of he, he needs to get with that first guy that we talked to. You know, they can talk about their yeah. woes of their clay soil. Here's the definition of clay. Clay is, is, is soil made up of extremely fine particles. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have any sand and it. it doesn't have much sand in there at all. So it's, it's very tiny particles. There is incredible crops and turf grown in clay. So the the that North Texas soil, or we used to call it Mississippi mud, that's some of the best crop soil out there. It holds moisture. Uh, in drought, I, I know that when I was treating lawns a few years ago in Montgomery, the, the lawns in the prairie clay soil, which is highly clay, uh, they would not need irrigation anywhere near as often as the sandier loamy type soils that were out of that clay. So don't throw clay under the bus. That's the size of the soil particle. Now, are there some good clays and bad clays? Sure. But it may have a lot more to do with uh, compaction or pH or something like that, more so than it has to do with the particle size of the soil. So anyway, uh, it's, I believe it's hard for many plants to live in the clay soil. What is the best amendment? I believe I'd try to grow it in the clay. I try to fix whatever's wrong with it. A lot of clays may have an extremely high or extremely low pH, and that makes the clay look bad, but that can be amended with something like lime, or in the case of being uh, high, a real high pH, uh, maybe just stay away from plants that don't like high pH. Uh, so I, I'm not I'm not afraid of clay. I, I, again, he might be, he or she might be more, Charles may be more, um, might clarify what kind of clay. Because if you go to Georgia, it's that old red clay. And if you go to Mississippi or North Texas, it's probably the prairie clay. And so the, there are a world of difference between those. Um, I would try to just do the basic things to grow turf. Air, if, you, if aerator works, do it. But I don't know that you can get something to get into the soil to change it a lot. Um, get the pH right get the water right, you can probably go to good turf. Yeah, you know, I always try to remind people that the Bermuda grow on the 
on the cracks of your driveway and all kind of, I mean, it, it's not too particular uh, as far as the soil. So, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name, uh, but it's a 16, four, eight, a good fertilizer ratio for St. Augustine grass. Thanks for the informative lives. Well, sixteen four eight is very general. If I if I had to just choose something to um, maybe cover the bases, I like that. I like that more than a say a fifteen oh fifteen or a triple thirteen. Uh, I think phosphorus is not needed in the high amounts that some fertilizers have, and so I think six, sixteen four eight is a guess a four to one to two ratio. I think it's good for any grass. Um, but if he did a soil test, he may find out that he's he's already high in phosphorus and doesn't need anything in the middle, doesn't need the four. So he's just paying for something that's going down, you know, with the fertilizer. So, uh, but I like that as far as just shooting from the hip. I think you cover the bases with that four to four to one to two ratio without getting into a lot of trouble or being too expensive. All right, comfort lunk here. Uh, this guy, I believe, he's in Georgia, James, maybe North Georgia. He said, "Passed my test last week, James. What liquid fert would you recommend for fescue?" He, he's probably got some uh, Bermuda yards and and then a little bit of cool season grass too. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's which one as much as it is how much. And uh, there's there's a debate. I would ask Comfort Lawn Care owner to go to the NC State website and see if you can find some research that was done on uh, how much nitrogen to give fescue during the summer. Uh, there's some that say if you you know if you really crank it up, the nitrogen, especially like um, with just a lot of fast in fast nitrogen, it's going to release all at one time. I got one colleague that calls it juicing up the fescue. If you juice it up in the summer, you create an environment for brown patch and brown patch is a foliar disease in fescue that can hurt it significantly. And it might not even uh, grow out of it, you know, until the fall, you might have to overseed or reseed or interseed. Um, so I'm thinking just very small amounts. What a lot of guys would do is maybe put a 10th of a, pound of in in a liquid application and maybe do more micronutrients, a little liquid iron or something like that. But I think where you really need to land is how much nitrogen do you feel is right for your summer? And you're pretty far south if you're in Georgia. So you're not in Nashville and you're not in Indianapolis. And so the summer's going to probably be hotter where you, I think he's in Dalton or up that way in Northwest Georgia, if I remember right. Um, so I, I tell you what I would do if I could, I would go with an extremely slow release granular that I put down in March, maybe, or April and let it trickle into the summer and let it fade out. And if he does any liquid spray and maybe just go with micronutrients or something like that, but that is under debate and I'm not sure I've landed somewhere. <laughs> I'm still listening to the debate as far as how much. So some say it creates uh, too much nitrogen creates the, uh, brown patch and it does, but some but NC state says, if you don't put enough, you get brown patch and it, you don't have enough growth to recover and mow off the brown patch. So that debate's still out there. All right. My customers have more weeds than grass. I just don't know how to make their yard look better. Solo operator. I feel like they may drop me, but I don't offer weed control services uh marcus i'm not sure is that what the question is there are you are you mowing lawns or are you you say you don't offer weed control so if, if you're mowing lawns and they got more weeds and grass out that's not really a problem just mow the weeds you know but uh you know i if you're if you're wanting to get in uh, you know i don't know maybe maybe make another comment and pose the question in there so we learn how also, to where also, where is he? What, what state yeah. is he in? What, what grass should do they want or, or is supposed to be there? That that would help me help him. Yeah, every question. If you guys are still posting a question, we're, James, we probably got 20 questions lined up that we haven't got to. So, so it might be a while. But if you if you got a uh, 
question that you hadn't posted yet, put where you're from, like what city you're in, because that that makes a big difference, uh, especially when it comes to like weed control and fertilization and stuff. Joseph, oh, he asked a question earlier. He's in Clanton, Alabama. Now we know where the Clanton is, and, and a lot of people know where the Peach Park is and stopping and getting that fried apple, fried pies and ice cream. I'm trying to remember what he asked earlier. Let's see, but oh, he asked that. Uh, Oh, he's in. He's yeah. the one with the centipede lawn, wanting to know yeah. how to keep it from uh, putting up the the stalk. Yeah, he could spray manor and then go eat some uh, Alberta peaches. There you go. All right, Sean says, "What fungus do I have in my zoysia? Rusty colored edges around damaged looking grass." He's out in Southern California. Well, he hit. He may have hit the perfect word with rusty. There's something called zoysia grass rust, and it is a disease. It seems to hit and, and cause an orange powdery. Uh, I've even seen somebody walk through the lawn with white shoes or, or even boots, and they end up having this orange powder all over their feet, and that's the uh, pustules or the, the spores from that uh, disease that's called zoysia grass rust. And we're in central Alabama when I had problems with it and the Auburn area where I am now, where Auburn University is, um, I had, it, it's generally this time of the year when it hasn't warmed up enough to grow, the fertilizer hasn't worked yet because it's still cool and it hasn't rained enough. All those things together are not making the grass grow. So it's in this stunted kind of condition or stagnant condition. And it seems like rust hits it then and generally grows out of it. Uh, most universities, at least in my area, would recommend just grow it out of it. Don't try to spray a fungicide. You could, but I, I think you'd be able to uh, just grow the grass out of it. Again, Southern California, I'm not sure, you know, what state their zoysia is in correct right now. Status. All right. What do you recommend for sand spurs in Bermuda? And what do you recommend for them in centipede? Thanks. Sometimes, James, uh, people say sand spurs. I, I'm wondering if they're talking about that that mm -hmm. burr weed or something. You know, I mean, I I don't know. When I think of sand spurs, I'm thinking of the big, <laughs> big spurs. But it, anyway, I don't know. Maybe there is sand spurs. Yeah, this is where it would help to have the state. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's Bermuda and centipede, so they're probably somewhere between I-10 and I-20, somewhere in that stretch. But um, yeah. Let's let's believe that it is sand spurs. Uh, that that's a grassy weed, kind of like crabgrass, and uh, it's an annual. Uh, sometimes I've seen it where it perennialized, where it didn't get cold enough to kill it. Um, in Bermuda, you could probably use. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, I want to say Celsius has sand spurs on the on the label, uh, but but I, I might be looking at Drive or Quinclorac there. And in the case of centipede, I might be looking at solitaire, which has some quinclorac in it, but it's the only place you can get quinclorac that has a centipede label. So if it is the grassy weed with a tall stalk with a bunch of spike balls up there, when we were kids and I grew up in an area where there was a lot of sand spurs, uh, mean kids would pick them and throw them on somebody's back and just pin their shirt to their skin, you know? Uh, kind of cruel, but they they have barbs on them where it's it's hard to pull. It's kind of like a fish hook. It's hard to pull out without feeling that barb resisting. Uh, so if it's if it's sand spurs, as in the little cool season plant that looks like parsley, which is lawn burrweed, it's also called spurweed. Uh, that's a cool season annual, and used to atrazine and simazine will work on it. I'm believing now that it's getting resistant to it. Uh, change up works uh, on there. Uh, change up in MSM or Manor combined uh, will do a good job on there. The problem, if it's that particular weed, is that if the spurs are already formed and you kill it, it's still going to stick tender bare feet. So you got to get it before the spur is formed. All right. This guy says, My parents say, and I like your dog there. So my parents say I can mow lawns for the summer. I'm going to get an LLC licensing and insurance, start mowing lawns. Any tips? I want to buy a truck by the end of the season is my goal. Uh, my my advice would be, I mean, not just for a, a young guy, but anybody, you know, if you kind of 
decide find the right neighborhood maybe somewhere close to where you live where you there's a lot of houses and they're they're flat and you know real easy lawns for mowing purposes to where you can try to really get a lot of yards in the same neighborhood because if you just you know especially if you don't have a vehicle or you're relying on somebody else but if, if it was maybe in your own neighborhood and you had a opportunity to get quite a few yards because what happens is and i see it over and over again you get one yard and you do a good job you end up getting five on the same street you know well if you just pick some random yard out in out that doesn't have any neighbors you don't have the opportunity to to really stack up a lot of lawns so i would kind of target one or two neighborhoods maybe three that had a lot of houses and see if you can't kind of break into that market there and get you a few customers and and i wouldn't sell yourself short because you're young i mean you know this is a great learning opportunity to learn about business and you know if you go out there and just say i'll mow for 20 bucks because i'm young you you're, you're doing yourself a disservice and people are going to take advantage of you all right can't find a large quantity of centipede seed in mississippi do you know a seller i'm sure if you surely you can find some online i i don't i don't know um i would think you could order that from pennington or one of these seed suppliers um online is it james you have to wait till it gets hot to do the centipede seed or is it hot i mean i saw here in alabama it's showing 90 this weekend so i mean i guess yeah. that's pretty hot people i know that uh i had a customer call me the other day and he, he had planted probably back in march and he said it still hadn't come up i said it's it's probably not until it gets hot. So I would wait till you're pushing towards that 90 degree yeah. type stuff. Yeah. Bermuda might come up earlier, but centipede's a little stubborn and it's slow to, to germinate. I've heard people say that they put it down, didn't see anything forever. And then toward the end of the summer, all of a sudden there's centipede everywhere. And so don't give up on it. Um, and, and I'm not sure I would try to plant it on top of the ground. I would try to scratch things up a little bit where it has some seed to soil contact that may be more important for centipede than say cool season grass seed terry says is there anything i can use to spray for weeds in blue pacifica junipers uh i don't know i, I don't know about legally <laughs> I, mean, I think there's lots of you play a spray on junipers that won't kill them necessarily but i don't know uh, if any of them are legal Lontrail is a herbicide that you can spray over the top. Image is one you can spray over the top of some junipers. What you need to do though is look at the label and see if that uh, blue Pacifica is one of the ones that's tolerant of that herbicide. So there are a few, but the word weeds is not quite giving us what we need. Is it grassy weeds? Is it broadleaves? Is it annual weeds? If it's annual weeds, you can, you can start interrupting that cycle with a pre-emergent in those junipers, something like uh, freehand or uh, snapshot uh, that would prevent those weed from germinating in there. So knowing whether it's a grassy weed, because if it's a grassy weed, you can use some of the grass killers that don't hurt shrubs, uh, non-grassy shrubs. And so something like fusillade or uh, you know, like clethodem is one of them. Um, that would, that would kill some of the grasses that grow up in there. So it, it really depends on what kind of weed he or she has. Uh, I would look at Lontrell, L-O-N-T-R-E-L, and look at the label where it says for use in uh, shrub beds and see if the weeds that it controls and the plants that are tolerant of it are fit what Terry's looking for. James, we're going to have to shorten our answers a little bit it's not your fault we are just we're way behind on the questions <laughs> uh, i think i know terry kennedy anyway he can call he can call me on the side later on there you go terry all right sand spurs everywhere from marcus uh comfort long hair says by the way my harold's rep is awesome uh <laughs> sebastian says good afternoon jason would you recommend landscaping school if so what comes with it I've, I've never been to a landscaping school, Sebastian. J James, um, you got a, a nephew that teaches what horticulture? What does he teach? You yeah. know, I, I guess that'd be a little different. You went, to, you got an agronomy degree, but what? Are you familiar with any kind of landscaping school? You know, some of the universities would do just continuing education 
and talk talk about the the uh, setting of landscape plants. You know, just basic information where you can go to a seminar and pick up. You know, what's the wrong thing to do? How deep to plant things? Uh, you may even get into some kind of design and stuff. But there are degrees that you can get from universities where uh, landscape design. So you have to actually go in and draw up something that looks good around that property, around that house, uh, and and select the right kind of plants that will live in that situation uh, kind of thing. So you can get actually get a degree in landscape design, but there's a lot of seminars. I would check with your local university. Again, we don't know where you are. So it'd be hard for us to tell you, give you any direction of what school to go to. All right, Matthew, James, I'm not sure. Can you read that? I don't know if I can even, uh, I'm not sure I can read the question. It's a good question, yeah. but can you interpret that for all the rest of us lay yeah. people? Uh, vigor is low, so it's, it's and it's chlorotic. Chlorotic being uh, kind of yellow. Uh, everything is normal except P and calcium levels. P is at 60 points per million. Calcium is around 600 points per million. Could those be inhibiting growth? Uh, you know what? When you when you do a soil test, usually there's a range that that soil test will give you that is acceptable. So I, I, most soil tests will give you a recommendation if if the if the uh, nutrients you're looking at are too low, they will talk to you about what to add and how much to add. If they're extremely high, I've not run into phosphorus and calcium toxic levels, <laughs> toxicity levels, which would be way too much. So uh, I would, I, it depends on what your uh, crop is too. So again, we don't know where you are and what your grass type is. So that would help anybody listening, try to give us your state and what kind of grass you're looking at. Does water in late in the evening come with any risk? Yeah, uh, especially in warm season grasses, you uh, things like gray leaf spot and dollar spot can be just quadrupled uh, because you're creating a prolonged wet leaf period. And so if you could water in the morning and let the sun dry the, the leaves off, you interrupt that long wet leaf period and you interrupt the the progress of the disease so I'm, I'm gonna make that short and sweet so yes are flower beds including your weed fert control or is it separate I'll, I'll speak for me joe i i uh i do it separate because you know it is it's separate products almost all the time so i offer that as an extra service and can fertilize their shrubs or i do uh, we control in the flower beds, but those are all extra things. And then some people go out with, you know, full fledged tree and shrub program, but that's, again, that's usually a separate whole deal aside from the lawn because you're using different products, um, you know, than you would use in the grass. Combo, hey Jason, yeah, go ahead. When somebody calls it flower beds, when I was growing up, that was the bed that the shrubs might be in. There may not be any flowers there. Yeah. And so but there really is a difference if there's actual uh, annual flowers, if it's a color bed, there's, you do not want to use herbicides that you can use in a shrub bed because uh, it can hurt those uh, annual flowers like, uh, you know, petunias, pansies, those kind of things. So, uh, but other, other than, I would not even get into the color bed uh, weed control business. Like if I sprayed SureGuard on there but a, a month before they planted their, their little <laughs> begonias or whatever it probably wouldn't be good some people that try to keep weeds out of those color color beds with the pre-emergent generally hurt the plants and almost none of them are labeled for color beds annual flowers so you anyway. know i have a yellow i have spots of yellow from over fertilization in any remedies well we said tell us what kind of grass and where they live <laughs> well we, we're asking uh any remedies i've when our when uh, when I was in the business and we got a little foliar burn, I had some green dye, and I went out and just spot treated the green dye, this turf dye, and uh, kind of masked the discoloration until the rain and the fertilizer kicked in and grew out of those injured areas. So you actually could could dye it again. I, I'm I'm going burn. I'm I'm assuming it's burn that the turf is burned, not necessarily. Uh, chlorotic yellow, but more more of a yellow dead leaves. <laughs> All right. Would you rather start a treatment business with a used rider like a permagrain or a new 
two to three hundred gallon skid setup in the truck. They seem similarly priced. I'd say yes. <laughs> I think you should own both of them. Uh, yeah. If I could, if I could only have one, I'd have to go with the skid. Um, and but I would, I would have a permagreen type spray uh, right on right behind it. There you uh, go. I, I would try to own both of those. But if I only have one, I think I would go hose and sprayer. Joel has three questions in a row here. Do you have a flat price for each application? Uh, you do, or does it vary per app? Uh, it's flat price. I think you now. There's the only time there's an exception. Let's say you do something like you're gonna. Let's say you, uh, if you didn't have a fungicide built into your program and they needed a fungicide app, and that you, if you had that flat price you're charging for that lawn, you may find out you're actually losing money on that application. So there's some exceptions to it, but I you don't want to get into. Application one is twenty eight dollars. Application two is forty six dollars. Application three is thirty seven dollars. I mean, that would be a nightmare for the business and the customer. I feel like. Uh, does some of your application rounds in your programs include insect fungal controllers at all? Fert and weed control. James, wouldn't you say there's a lot, a lot of them do? Don't you know? A lot of people put that in there, and then some people don't. What What's your? As you work with a lot of people, what do you see most people doing? I think there's exceptions. Uh, if I had St. Augustine uh, program, I'm including insecticide for chinch bugs, period. Uh, I don't want to wait till that happens because they actually kill the grass. They don't just eat it. Uh, and fungus type things. A lot of guys in cool season properties, fescue and stuff like that will include it uh, to keep brown patch down. So those are two things off the top of my head that, that I feel like probably need to be included in what I call the regular program. Uh, in other places, I would make it an optional application like army worms, insecticide for army worms or, or uh, mole crickets, things like that. Maybe even grubs, I might make it where I'm charging extra for that. And then as far as disease control, I would, I would try to do a preventative on the ones that are predictable, like large patch in Zoysia, St. Augustine and Centipede. I would try to sign people up that have those grass types and make that an extra charge instead of part of the program. And last question from Joel, is there ever a point where you get uncomfortable putting out herbicide given how hot it can get in the summer? What do you do on the hot summer days? Yeah, you gotta know which herbicide and what turf type. Again, I don't know where he is in this question or what kind of grass he's got. So hard to perfectly answer that, but you, you need to know your label should say, do not use on temperatures over 85 degrees or over 80 degrees. The label should give you those precautions and warnings uh, to not use it. But then make sure you know that the weed control you're using is going to kill the weeds you have. And so if you're just taking a weed control product because you can, and you just spray it because you can, as opposed to knowing what your target is and how effective that product would be on the target and how target weed, and how much turf tolerance you'll have. You need to put all those things together uh, for your approach. Yeah, for me, like I, I'll, I'll when it gets hot, I'll switch over and start using more Celsius and, and not, I, I kind of use blindside more in the now, but when it gets super hot, blindside sometimes burn a hole. And you can mix at low rates, you can spray lightly, you can spray early in the morning before it gets too hot. But, you know, I don't, you got to use common sense on some of that too. Uh, and what height are you cutting Bermuda on? Are you going up a bit in the summer months? Thanks, Jason. I love your channel. I've cut mine an inch and a half. That's that's because that's as low as my mower will go. <laughs> and, uh, and I cut it today at an inch and a half. Um, now that's my Bermuda. I got some zoysia. I raised it up a little. I was cutting my zoysia at three inches today, and I cut my St. Augustine at four inches. So, but my I'm primarily Bermuda, and I cut it an inch in the summer months. I, I don't want to raise mine up, but if I, you know, happen to go out of town and don't mow for two weeks, then then I may have to bump it up a little bit. Or I just I'm not worried about my own yard making a little yellow, so I'll cut it back down anyway and risk a little discoloration. Um, or I break out the the growth regulator and spray it, and that helps me keep it low. I used to tell a homeowner. 
establish your frequency first. How often are you willing to mow it? There you that, go. That, that has so much to do because if they say, well, we're only going to mow every two weeks, we can't afford blah, blah, you know, anyway. And, but establish how often you're going to mow. And I always said, mow as close as you can at that interval, leaving the lawn 95% as green as it was before you cut it. There you if go. If you're getting into 50% brown, that's too low for that frequency. Yeah, and, and you can get by with every other week in April. You you can't get by it every other week in July when it's raining and it's been burlized. You know, I mean, and keep it at an inch and a half. You just you you'll be scalping it for sure. Uh, thank you for both. It makes our job easier with the knowledge you guys have at hand. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Travis says, "What's the best soil amendment amendment for sandy soils down in Orlando?" See, James, he told us where he where he lives. There you I go, Travis. He's got some. Uh, St. Augustine down there just started to oh to, he wants to uh wants to, to a soil amendment to help it hold more moisture. Just starting to use a product that has fish, cold water kelp, molasses, yucca, <laughs> you say yucca or yucca extract, humate liquid, and a two zero two. All right, and there you go, James. What what yeah. what's a, I think stick with the first question there. What's a soil amendment to help lawn hold more moisture in Orlando? there's there's actually some products that are um oh boy uh, that that will help retain moisture you can get them in a granular form spread them and water them in and they tend to to hold it be a, a um, i'm just drawing a blank like you do on SureGuard. um <laughs> but it is a um not a penetrant but there's some that make soil drain they they will that, that you can add that will uh, a wetting agent is the word I'm looking for. My goodness. Uh, there's some wetting agents that will move the, the water through the soil profiling and, and make a poorly drained soil better or more drained, well drained. And then there's some that are real sandy and it'll tend to make it hold moisture so that you can get, so you could look at wetting agents and see which one uh, is the type that you can buy locally or somewhere down in, the Orlando area. I know Harold's has a whole line of, of those products, uh, but you'd want one that you could apply watered in and then somehow collects in that soil profile and holds moisture. And I've seen pictures where, where it was treated, uh, the soil, the, the grass was real hydrated and off the, off the path of where it was not treated, it was already uh, dried up and uh, wilted. So they, they do make a difference. So there is something like out, like that out there. Right. On that on that product, how's he going to know which one of those eight things are going to really help his turf? It could uh, be just it could be just the molasses helps. Yeah, I've been uh, I hadn't been drawing a blank a blank on SureGuard lately, James. I've been drawing a blank go. on what kind of zoysia I have. I keep I I can't from day to day. I can't remember if I've got Zeon or Zorro zoysia in my, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I got Zorro, but I'm not. That might be Z on tomorrow. Uh, I live in Washington. The weather is super bipolar. Uh, did he ask a question earlier? I'm not sure. Yeah, he asked, uh, oh, landscaping school up in Washington. Yeah. Uh, I think Oregon, Oregon State, uh, is, maybe Washington State is the, as the ag school of agriculture, I would just check with something along those lines, see what kind of, continuing education they have find out uh which school has a horticulture program up there wise guy says what's the recommendation recommended pounds uh i guess for pounds of nitrogen for zoysia per app and the total for the year central alabama with a z52 zoysia lawn you should well, be familiar with that james central alabama yeah. with a z he may be in montgomery <laughs> um Central Alabama, Dr. Beth Gertal did some work at Auburn, which is also Central Alabama, uh, and showed that as you exceeded two pounds of nitrogen per thousand per year, you started attracting all kinds of problems to the zoology. It went backwards. So there's a law of diminishing returns. So when you exceed two pounds of N uh, per thousand per year, you got into trouble. Same thing's true with centipede. And so the, the zoysia resists being over fertilized. You, you can't just keep pushing the nitrogen and get it even greener, even better. 
because at some point it's going to turn and go south on you. Uh, what I would do, and again, when you talk about fertilizing, there's fast release products where all the nitrogen is released at one time and the grass cannot eat it all, so to speak. It's like drinking water from a fire hydrant. And then there's a slow release version where it's trickling out and spoon feeding the turf. So two pounds of, of nitrogen in the slow release form per year is going to extend the color and the longevity and the attractiveness of that lawn in a better way than two pounds uh, of fast release where it all comes out at one time, one pound, then two months later do one more pound. You'll have a green lawn, but I would go with as much slow release as I could and limit your uh, fertilizer to your nitrogen to one pound applications and uh, two per year. And I'd, I'd do one in May and probably another one in July or something like that on, on Zoysia. Charles says, I live in Vicksburg, Mississippi with warm season grass. It's humic 12 and uh, something. The other two products good for your grass. Yeah. I'm just going with this humic acid. It's a soil health thing. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the thing, you might not have been on there, Charles. Uh, when we were talking about it, but uh, if your soil health is already there, if it's already good, it should respond to, to regular fertilization and care. And if it's struggling, you might try and try a product like that to see if it improves the soil health. And what we mean by that is the, is the beneficial microbes that create an environment for the roots of the turf to do really well and absorb really well and improve through stressful periods because they got good roots. And so, good question, but you'd have, you'd have to try it. And I suggest having a check plot where you, you do part of the lawn and not part of the lawn and compare those. Keith says, what grassy weed looks similar to crabgrass but has purple edges on the leaf blade, tends to grow horizontally? Dallas grass? I've seen purple in Dallas grass. Yeah. I see it on the edge, and it, it does kind of grow horizontally, and I've, it does have a little, a little purplish tint. That's probably what it is. That'd be my best guess. Keith, we need to know where you are. <laughs> All right. That would help. Uh, what do you recommend to get rid of POA trivialis? Is that what they call it, James? Trivialis? Yeah. Uh, I'm in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I hear people talk about that weed a lot. I know it's a tough one. What? Um, Actually, in the South, actually overseed Bermuda greens with, with Poetria, and of course it dies when it gets hot. So it's, it's not a problem hanging around uh, down this far South. But uh, I, I, I would love to know what he's getting rid of it out of. You know, is it in fescue? Uh, and there, I, there may be some selectivity to kill a Poa, which is the bluegrass genus you got poa annua uh poa trivialis uh poa pretensis there's a bunch of poas but anyway um i would have to know what kind of grass is in and then i still might not know, know the question but i would start asking about some selectivity between the poas and the non-poas if he has fescue there may be a product that'll take one out of the other i'm just not familiar with it all right here's a tip, tip for you james you may not have heard I have a friend who kills the stickers in his Bahia grass with triple 13 and swears by it. I'm going to have a hard time with that. <laughs> yes. You know uh, what? I'm yeah. thinking that must be a coincidence that about the time <laughs> he puts the triple 13 is when the heat kills his uh, Anyway. Stickers. I don't know about that. Yeah, it's dying. It's probably dying right now. From uh, the heat. And again, it depends on where effective diesel is. Hey, I killed the uh, hen bed in my yard the other day, James, with some uh, with some fertilizer. It just I put it out, and next thing I knew, the hen bit was dead. Yeah, killed, killed the poa too. Yeah, <laughs> you're being funny. Uh, it's, no, di I, it's dying. I, I it's dying. It's dying. I don't think the triple thirteen does anything. He's fertilizing. Well, you could you could you could uh, put it down heavy enough to burn the foliage and kill it. You could. All right. Lawn reputation says enjoyed enjoying the conversation. Seth, he's one in Southern California. He hadn't moved yet. Most of the zoysia is in a strong growing stage right now, but some areas seem to never grow tall enough to mow for months. Uh, he's the one who was talking about having the fungus, I believe, too. I remember that uh, rust. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I hear people, James, talk, you know, in our area, zoysias, 
do great, you know, but I hear them talk. Some people complain about zoysia, like up north, they'll say, they have a few of them. They say, oh, it's only green like two months out of the year or something. <laughs> you know, I, I just wonder if maybe the climate he's in over there might maybe not perfect for it or something. Yeah. I don't know. Sean, I would check with your local uh, extension service. You know, the uh, I guess California has those, but people that recommend the right grass type for your area and, and who could look at a soil test and tell you what to do uh, for it not to – for you to be fertilizing monthly and and not getting it to grow tall enough to mow, that's strange. So something's going on there. All right, West Texas here. Overseeded my Bermuda with Arden 15 seed over the weekend. I mowed low about a half inch. Should I hold off on mowing for two three weeks until the seeds start to establish? I don't think mowing will hurt the establishment of the seed. All right. There you go. Charles says, Jason, you must have got a new internet provider. We knew that would happen. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I had some real issues with the, uh, uh, and I found it wasn't actually the internet, though. We, we did have, we did get better internet not too long ago. And I'm not at my house. So this is part of the problem. I'm, my house is currently under being uh, worked on. So we had bad internet. We got good internet. And then I had a bad, I found I had a bad computer. So I got a different computer and that fixed the problem. Thanks for noticing, Charles. Matt says, what's your go-to problem to treat untreated Bermuda lawns with weeds? Grassy weeds giving us the biggest issue, needing additional treatments using a backpack sprayer. What do you get? We tell somebody in May the 17th that's got a weedy Bermuda lawn with a backpack sprayer. When they say grassy weeds given the biggest issue. That has to be crabgrass, Dallas grass, sedges look grassy. So... You know, I might try solitaire. It's got quinclorac in there for, for crabgrass. Um, again, we would almost need to know what all those weeds are. Or we'd be shooting from the hip. <laughs> but ne so by I, next year, you need to get your pre-emergent out early. I mean, you, you just, you, you're fighting an uphill battle this time of year, to be honest with you. Nothing's been done to it. That's my thoughts. Travis says, I see mostly liquid fertilizer is cheaper than granular. I want to try it out, but I'm hesitant to use liquid due to my location and heat. Uh, and oh, I'm sorry. And here, liquid for anyway. I don't know. Our Bermuda zoysia is bad. Uh, he's in Lake Oconee, Georgia. You know where that is? I think so. Sounds yeah. like North Georgia. Can you uh, talk, to James, just a minute? You were sort of explaining one time about the, um, you know, the the. Is is it cheaper? Is it really cheaper than granular when you when you break down the cost? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Is everybody sitting down? Uh, <laughs> liquid fertilizer is is melted granular fertilizer into water. <laughs> uh, more more likely, liquid fertilizer is dissolved dry fertilizer into water, and. Uh, so you need to know the um, the concentration. So you might have a two and a half gallon jug of liquid fertilizer that in that whole uh, jug, there's one pound of nitrogen in there. And you may have a bag of fertilizer that's the same price that has uh, 15 pounds of nitrogen in it. So if you're just looking at package size and say, well, this is this jug is cheaper than that bag. Uh, that's that's not apples for apples at all. And so one problem with liquid fertilizer is depending on what source is in that liquid fertilizer, you're coating the leaves with a very salty uh, product, whereas a granular is going to fall between the leaves and hit the ground and not burn the leaves. You can burn some grass leaves with a liquid salty fertilizer unless you use it at extremely low rates. And a lot of liquid fertilizer is uh, not highly concentrated. That makes it cheap. Okay, so you pound for pound, I've never seen liquid fertilizer be cheaper than a granular pound for pound. Maybe package for package, but that's misleading. That's not apples for apples. So All right. they, hey, both, they both have a place. They both have a place in the market. What? We're going to keep answering the questions that are on here. We still got about 10 more questions. Probably, please, if, if you don't mind, 
Yeah, I'm good. Cut, cut off the future questions, and let's just go through the ones we got here. And uh, so uh, Matthew said, or this is the guy that had the question I had to get you to interpret for me. James talking about the uh, – what was he talking about? The the chloralysis. Remember that? Yeah, chlor chlorosis. Chlora yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Anyway, he's, he's talking about – he said uh, – only certain would love to send an offline message and discuss further with you or James. So, um, good evening. Uh, Marcus says, sorry for the incomplete question. I'm in central Alabama. I'm not sure what to do to make my customer's yards look better, loaded with sand spurs and clovers. Um, yeah, he was the one, Marcus was the one saying he's got the yards that mostly weeds and not much grass, but he doesn't do weed control. You might want to try to find you a weed control buddy that you can partner up with. And uh, he can send you some mowing business and, and you send him the weed control and that and that can recommend those to your customers. But, you know, on the good side, some of the some of those yards like the clover and stuff, they'll, they'll sort of won't be as active as the weather gets hot. They'll kind of lay a little lower and the, some of your other weeds will die out. You know, I mean, you'll have new weeds. <laughs> your, your crabgrass might take over, but, you know, they, they'll be it'll start looking a little bit more like a lawn in the summertime, even, even if you do nothing, but I'd try to find somebody you could partner up with, not, not like a business partner, but just somebody you could refer customers. A single, to. a single application of fertilizer could make the grass really fill in and, uh, it, it, and make it compete with the weeds a little better, especially if it's getting mowed. Keith says he's in West Tennessee with a Bermuda lawn. I'm going to try to find what he, he was the one. Oh, that had the, purple edges on his grassy weeds. Yeah, Dallas grass in Memphis. All right. Uh, Jeepers Creepers says, would it be okay to fertilize centipede even if the customer doesn't have irrigation? They want to use a 14-4-14. Customer just won't spurt and I guess no weed control. Yeah. The, look at that first 14 to, if you divide it by two, that means in a 50 pound bag, there's seven pounds of nitrogen. Uh, I would not put more than that bag on more than 7,000 square, on less than 7,000 square feet. So if they got a 7,000 square foot lawn, only put one bag down. And I might not do it again on centipede with that much fast release. Again, we don't know whether that 14 is, has some slow release in it or, or not. I have a feeling it's all fast release. But you could apply it a bag per 7,000, a bag per 8,000, stretch it out a little bit. But you don't want to exceed one pound of N per thousand if especially if it's all fast release and i think they'll even without irrigation do it right before rain or when rain's predicted and i think you'll be in good shape caleb says hey guys what should my saint augustine fertilizer schedule look like south texas just north of houston how much and when and how much how about a fungicide application what kind of schedule would you have I'd, I'd probably, if it's, a, again, we're talking fast release, slow release, I, I would probably not go over two pounds of nitrogen. Even if a recommendation says you could put three to four, I, I just think when you start juicing up the nitrogen on St. Augustine, you create an opportunity for gray leaf spot. And if it's late in the season, create an opportunity for large patch disease to be worse than it would be if you ran it a little lean. Um, again, what disease we're looking at, you know, fungicide application. I would say the two biggest diseases in my mind are gray leaf spot and large patch. Gray leaf spot would be in the humid summer and the more heavily nitrogen fertilizer that you approach that you've had, the worse the um, gray leaf spot's going to be. The more shady that St. Augustine lawn is, the worse the, the gray leaf spot can be. I would be looking at a fungicide to generally what I did in the past is when I experienced that with the customer, then I sold it as an additional application. But if I weren't, I was not having uh, the gray leaf spot, then I did not. But if they had large patch, I'd use that as an opportunity to do a preventive type fungicide. You'd probably do that in October-ish uh, in South Texas for your St. Augustine, excuse me. Um, Fertilizer, I'm probably going to do one in April and one in June. You might, if you made lighter rates, you might could go three applications 
But again, I, I like the idea of a slow release so that you apply it less often and it trickles out over a long period of time. Alex says, how do you knock out common Bermuda in your hybrid Bermuda? I noticed that today, Alex, in my yard, I hadn't cut in a couple of weeks and the, the common Bermuda had put up a seed head a lot faster than the, the hybrid. Uh, so it's pretty easy to pick out, but how do you, how do you get rid of it, James? Do you have any tips? You know, I, I don't. Um, I think mowing frequently uh, and mowing close uh, may be to the advantage of the hybrid and be a little stressful on the common. If it's real, if you really want to get rid of it, you could spray Roundup on it about this time of year and, and then plug plug some hybrid back in there because you got all summer to fill it back in. You know, I don't. You say a small patch. I don't know if small is a hundred square feet or a thousand square feet or what. Yeah. Um, how do you diagnose a grub problem and what's the best way to attack it? Any products in particular work best in Northwest Texas on fescue and Bermuda? Um, diagnosing is in, in warm season, uh, most of the grubs start being a problem in, I'm going to say June, May or June, something like that is a very small uh, larva or larvae. And, um, and then they grow to a larger size late in the year. So they're worse, they're bigger, they have a greater appetite, eat more roots later in the summer, and they're harder to kill. Uh, the diagnosis a lot of times is loose soil where you pull the grass up because it doesn't have much roots. Uh, another one that's probably even more devastating diagnosis is when the warm season grass goes into the winter with no roots and you have winter kill, so it just fails to green up zoysia it's real bad to do that if you've had grubs with it. I would uh, imidacloprid, um, Merit, uh, Criterion is imidacloprid, uh, is a product that is fairly cheap now. It's an older product. It's pretty cheap. So if you time it right and apply it when the grub uh, larvae are real young and the adults are hard shell beetles. And so when they come out in May, there's one called a May beetle, a June beetle. Uh, those things come out and mate and then lay eggs. And then you've got your young that are developing and starting to feed. And that's when, when they're young, that is the best time to control them. Uh, you can actually put, Jason, you can tell them what you do. You got a fertilizer with the imidacloprid on it. Yeah, you can do that. I used to put out the, the criterion separately, like in, in uh, June or May or June. But now I, I thought, well, that's just right when I'm putting out my slow release fertilizer. So, James taught me a new word. It's called sparge. You, I had him sparge the uh, the merit onto the fertilizer, and it, you know the, he had me tell him what rate I'm putting it out, when I'm putting it out. So anyway, now I can just do that at one time. So I, it, it's got the growth control and the fertilizer all in the same bag. I'm going to guess that the timing for fescue would be the same as Bermuda. All right, Jason, who does your hair? It's the same every q and A. I've always had great hair. I don't know what to say about it. It's just i don't I don't put a lot of stock in <laughs> hair and i don't I don't hang out with men who care a lot about their hair either. I just, that's a red flag in my mind. All right, uh, I have a mix of uh, turf type fescue kbg and perennial rye this was the the lady or the man i'm sorry i don't know if it's lewis or lois i'm sorry um lewis i'm thinking yeah i was saying they had the poa trivialis yeah so that I, I really, mixture yeah. of grasses well the kbg kentucky bluegrass is poa so I, I, i'm not sure there's a selective way of taking one poa out of another poa i'm not sure there may be i'm not sure Thanks for Thanks. the Q&A for us grass nerds. In Texas, we have a lot of poa right now in St. Augustine looking to maybe add certainty. What surfactant would you recommend? It's going to it's going to be dying real soon. That's you know, that's uh that's spending money right before it's going to naturally die. You could spray water on it and it will get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cuz it's going to die when it gets hot. What surfactant, just in general, do you recommend, James? There's something called an 80-20 and a 90-10. An 80-20 has 80% or 79% uh, of the active stuff, and I guess 20% inert ingredients or whatever. has a little to do with concentration on there. 90-10 would be 
even more so. I think they all are good. Some some surfactants are made just to break the water surface tension so that it smears. There's other surfactants or adjuvants that are made to penetrate. The one I sell more is more of a surfactant. It breaks the water tension, allows it to smear over, but it also uh, creates penetration into the cuticle of the weed leaf. But there's some that will stick on the surface. They call it a spreader sticker. So it spreads, the surfactant spreads the, the water beads out. It breaks that water tension and causes it to stick on the surface. Sometimes you don't want it to stick on the surface. You want it to actually go into the, into the surface. And uh, so you got several different things. So I would, it depends on what you're, you know, trying to do. I sell one that's a, a non-ionic 80-20 uh, penetrant and it has a defoamer in there. Uh, you, most of your surfactants are like soap. When you add water to them, they just suds go everywhere. And so adding a defoamer uh, to that product makes it really good for lawn care guys. But I think the idea is just to make your, we control product or uh, more effective. Chris says, I blanketed my centipede with 2,4-D to kill the dandelions. Four weeks later, the lawn exploded with yellow wood sorrel. What to use now in Clemson, South Carolina? Yeah. I tell you, Change Up. Um, change Up is a three-way type product that does not have 2,4-D in it. And I've seen it at a, at a, what was the rate? Um, a pint and a half per acre. That's that's a real low rate. I've seen that kill 100% of yellowwood sorrel. And it would have done a good job on the dandelions. It's more expensive, but what you're trying to do here is to kill as many difficult weeds as you can and have the least uh, side effects on the centipede and change up is excellent on that and has no 2,4-D in it. South Florida St. Augustine grass, does the yearly maximum on prodiamine, is it more of an environmental thing or will it damage the St. Augustine if I overapply? What rates do you use in your applications? Let me say this. A lot of those rates are established by the, the company that's getting approval for their product through EPA. They're, they're approaching EPA and saying, we think all we need is, uh, in the case of prodiamine 65WG, uh, 2.3 pounds of that per year, and and uh, and uh, EPA says, okay, if that's all you're going to use, we'll we'll approve your product to go to market. And so sometimes they'll approach EPA with a low um, annual amount so that they're not just turning the whole world toxic with high levels of everything. And so that could be one reason. The other reason is probably it's that annual rate is very effective and and increasing the application over the annual rate might not bring any return weed control wise for the person doing it. Uh, I can separate the damage. It's not so much that, that there's a minimum or maximum on there as it is with St. Augustine. If you need recovery, uh, all you have is stolons. That's the above the ground runners that creep out and peg down and high rates of prodiamine will hinder that and you'll have what we call loopers or just they're just flying up in the air the stolons are and they can't root down so a lot of those products will say something like use on established turf only and so when you need recovery you're not established and so you need to make sure when you got prodiamine down that you that you're not in the recovery mode or it can hinder it jeepers creeper says he's in south georgia he, he was the one as saying he wanted to fertilize the centipede lawn with a 14 Four, fourteen, or something. I notice you apply prodiamine with other post-emergents in the same tank mix with surfactant. Doesn't the prodiamine need to be watered in? Don't you need to wait a couple of days on the post-emergent? Yeah, wait. You know what? The a lot of those uh, post-emergent products are are rain fast or irrigation fast in an hour or two. Um, look at Jason's. Uh, he did a video on where he sprayed Roundup on Bermuda grass. And you, Mike, can remind us, you, you tried to wash it off after 10 seconds, after 10 minutes, yeah. and after one hour. And I think even after you walk, tried to wash it off in 10 seconds, you still got injury yeah. of that Bermuda from the Roundup. Yeah. Glyphosate. It gets in that plant quicker than you think. Uh, so I, what I used to tell customers, let's say uh, the pre-emergent needs irrigation, but wait. 
a few hours uh, or the next day uh, before you watered in so that the post emergent would be effective. So yeah, I agree with him on that. You need to wait a couple of days, but if it rains the next day, you may get a phone call. So I'd be, I'd be a little loose on how you communicate that to your customer. Uh, Caleb says large pet. He was saying uh, he's one earlier said he's, uh fungicide applications he's talking about preventing he was asking about your fungicide application in saint augustine i guess he's dealing with large patch so you need to put Absolutely. that in, houston, in the fall houston area was that him yeah i you know i i like the idea of making it an add-on service and uh because it needs to be preventative if you if you apply it if, if there's an outbreak in large patch in the fall and the lawn's ugly and you come in and treat it, there's not enough growing season in most cases for it to recover. So they spent money and they're still looking at dead spots or injured spots. And then it comes out looking the same way it went into the winter. So that March or April, when it starts coming out, you still see the big circles and they think, well, I've still got it. It didn't. So it's much better to prevent it than try to cure it because people are spending money. You want them to spend money and never see it instead of spending money and continue to see the residual effect of that disease. So doing it proactively, and I would say when the night temperatures drop into the low, mid to low 60s, with the first couple of cool uh, fall rainy fronts that come through, now irrigation can create this problem as well, uh, but I would be watching for those temperatures in the rain, and I would go out and treat all my lawns just prior to that happening, that, that sign up for that extra add on service for large patch in St. Augustine. He says, awesome. Thank you. Uh, when, when are you using liquid fur instead of granular? For me, it's when I've, I've got, I'm already doing something liquid. I'm, I'm using a post-emergent. I may have my pre-emergent in there and let's say the grass is beginning to come up. I'm adding just enough in there to maybe give it a little bit of boost, uh, at the end of transition or the beginning, uh, um, you know, late in transition when the lawn's greening up and I know it's going to be six or eight weeks before I come back with a granular, I may put some liquid in there. Some guys will melt urea in the tank. They'll take a soluble urea and melt it in the tank. The other time I'm going to do it is when I can't afford, not money wise, but can't, I don't want to add any more heavy nitrogen. So I want to do, to do the smallest amount. I may put a 10th of a pound of a nitrate type product late in the summer that won't last long, but will give me a little color boost when, when I'm doing a liquid application. So kind of in between what the granular can do. Grace says, what up, Jason? Enjoy your channel. Jacob says, thank you. Ryan says, is it mandatory to have an edger tool attachment for a string trimmer when at the job? And he is in Caribou, British Columbia, Canada. Hey, we know where BC is. It's because we're a, uh, Americans, we, we, we pick up <laughs> that part. Anyway, um, you know, I, most people in our area going to, they're going to want their yard edge. So, I mean, but I, I don't know what your mowing culture's like up there, but just about everybody around here is going to want sidewalks and driveway edged. Uh, but you can learn how to do it with a string trimmer, you know, if you want to do that. Hey, from uh, Seattle, Washington, any organic or natural products you can recommend? James, what do you tell, I'm sure in Seattle, Washington, there's probably a little, bigger market for that than in um, Alabama. I think your mill organite type products are an option. Uh, there's a company called Safe something, I can't remember, but they use a lot of poultry type stuff. It's uh, fully organic, uh, qualifies for being organic. Those are real expensive type products. I'm probably more of a hybrid person. I would, I like to see some organic maybe mixed in with some slow release polymer coated type things to get the, the extended release and the, the amount of release that I want over a period of time. He says, uh, what fertilizer would you recommend? You, you say slow release is better. What fertilizer would you recommend? They have centipede and Bermuda. <laughs> I don't, they're, they're, I, I would go with something like an 80% polymer coated slow release. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's at Lowe's or Home Depot. You may have to go to a company you know, like Harold's to get that. Um, there, some of our competitors have uh, those type things, but I would, I would say that um, it for it to trickle out over a long period of time instead of 
a huge surge is better for centipede, way better. And you don't have your peaks of color. You don't have a big blast of green and then it fades out. And then you have another blast of green when you apply it again. You've got a continual quality color going over many weeks of time because of that slow release. Max Bird says, are you familiar with any rush in the lawn? I think path rush is what I got. I've been researching. They're invasive. How do you get rid of those? You know, I, that's beginning to be more and more of a problem. I don't, I don't know if the word path has anything to do, but they're found in go golf cart paths uh, real bad in golf courses. It was high traffic and uh, I don't know if, Again, just compaction. They like to grow in the compacted area. So golf courses have a lot of trouble. I would go to your nearest golf course and ask them what they're doing about path rush. It's generally not in lawns as much unless it's real compacted. It can be there, but it's not generally. How do you recover a lawn from Brown Patch in St. Augustine in Charleston, South Carolina? Yeah. I'd have to ask what time of the year, you know. If it's this time of the year, it's going to naturally grow back because the disease is a is a cool temperature disease that puts stress on the St. Augustine or centipede because it's too cold for it to, to grow and grow out of it. So you'll see it when those night temperatures are in the 50s and low 60s like that with a lot of water, rainfall. Um, but generally speaking, unless it's in a lot of shade, it will naturally shut down and the grass will start putting out stolons and recovering in an area uh, when that disease window is no longer there. So you have to have the right, you have to have the right host. That's the St. Augustine, the disease, that's the rhizoctonia and the right environmental conditions. And so when the environmental conditions are no longer favorable for that disease, it kind of shuts down on its own. Thank you. Great content. Uh, great content. Hey guys, Waco, Texas with St. Augustine, Bermuda. Jason, you did a video on Bermuda. How much different would a St. Augustine program look like? Well, my, the uh, James one taught me all that stuff, but basically on the, the St. Augustine, you know, use less pre-emergent early in the year. You're typically not going to have the same crabgrass problem that you're going to have in a Bermuda yard at the fertilizer, uh, a little bit less nitrogen, like um, as far as that goes on the, on the fall, like I'm putting out spectacle flow in the fall. And I, I did it this year on my St. Augustine yards and I'm glad I did, but I used a lower rate than I did on the Bermuda Zoysia yard. So those are some of the differences. Do you know a back, battery backpack sprayer that doesn't leak? I've got a Milwaukee one. It, it doesn't leak. Um, I mean, I'm sure most any of them leak if you turn it upside down, but, um, it doesn't, doesn't, you know, I had any trouble with mine. Uh, Flow Zone, I think, makes one that I see people recommend, but I don't know if it, you know, leaks or not. Organic fertilizer option might be chicken feed, not chicken poop. And what up from Coyote? All right, guys, we're going to end it on Coyote's what up. <laughs> so thanks for all the questions and appreciate James uh, being with us. And you guys, as I mentioned at the beginning and those watching, if you want to get James as my sales rep for Harold's and he sells me all the weed control products, for a he's, he's taught me how to uh, run my business basically and helps me as I think through decisions for my business. So if you're in the, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Panhandle, Florida, West Georgia area, James can help you too. But if, if you're outside that area, if you want to buy from Harold's, which is who I buy from, he can help you get connected. So send me a message on, on Instagram or my, it's the lawn care life on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, and I uh, would get in touch with you and help you get connected. So thanks for everybody watching. We'll try to do this again next Monday night. Talk to you later. Bye. Good night.